ولد يمام نبيل وترعرع في بغداد قبل أن يتعرض هو وأسرته للنفي خارج العراق وانتهى به المطاف في لندن عندما كان في السادس عشر من العمر أكسبه اندماجه في المجتمع البريطاني العديد من الفرص لتسليط الضوء على حياة اللاجئين والنازحين من خلال عمله في الرياضة وفي الفن وفي التصوير الفوتوغرافي مؤخراً اكتشف قصة تغلب نبيل على الجوائز العرقية ورحلته الفريدة في توثيق حياة أشخاص مثله My name is Tony Farag. I'm a 21-year-old television journalism master student and I'm of Egyptian descent. I'm very excited to be joined by the sensational Yamem Nabil, a highly esteemed photographer, artist and writer. Yamem, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I was born in Iraq, I grew up in Europe, I lived all over the world and I find myself in London now. I'm an exile, I'm a son of an exile, I'm a son of a a poet and that's probably the best introduction that I could I could give. My father was a, a well-known and outspoken critic of Saddam's regime in Iraq and we were exiled when I was four years old. We lived all over the world for a year and a half which included France, Germany, war-torn Lebanon, uh, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at the time and then we ended up in Hungary where I grew up and when I was 16 we moved to the UK and I've been here ever since. What was your experience like in, in Hungary and all those other countries in Europe? It's a, it's a great experience. I, I, th- I think what I've lost by leaving Iraq or leaving home and leaving family and leaving things that were close and, and safe, I've gained with the experience of living um, in various countries, um, the good and the bad, and you take, you take that with you. And I think to my writing, to my photography, and to the other projects I've worked on, all those aspects and all those experiences have contributed. Hungary was home um, until it wasn't anymore. Um, until I, it was made clear to me that we weren't welcome, which was a, you know, a kind of a, a real awakening. Uh, I was beaten up by skinheads when I was 14, even though I thought I was part of that country. In terms of who we are, what our heritage, heritage is, um, we are always outsiders. And I felt that more than anywhere else um, in the UK. It's a, a country where I feel safe. I, I feel that the, the law protects me. But in terms of history with our heritage, I think we'll always be outsiders. So I guess kind of touching onto what you're saying about, you know, represent representation, which is kind of a way to, to describe what you're saying. Um, I guess the primary way you, you contribute to that is through your photography, would you say so? I'd say my writing and photography, I mean, I also I've, for 15 years I worked in, in, in conflict resolution using sports and providing a platform for education and development for, for young people in conflict zones in the Middle East. Through my work, I've, I've tried to, to bring people together. And my job is not for them to, to agree on something, but for my, my work is, I think, is to, to, to show every side what they are kind of putting blinders to. No, I, I really like that. I actually picked up on that with um, your, what you described Art Forward Media, which is um, a, a company, a production company you've co-founded, a multimedia production company. And um, you described it, part of its purpose was to transcend cultural, religious and geographical differences. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what, what does that mean to you? And why is that such an important issue? I know you've touched on it. But, yeah. Well, it's, it's, we wear our labels on the outside. You know, we're talking about the Middle East, 50s, 60s, that was harmonious. At the moment, now what I'm working on is an influence of exiled or immigrant Arab artists to European society. There is so much, for example, one of our, our greatest, Zaha Hadid, who sadly passed away a few years ago, the architect, who not only broke ground by being one of the most successful Arab architects, but as a woman architect in a man's world in the so-called West, where women are supposed to be more free, she broke ground. She is one of, if not the most successful and, and, and best known architects. She uses that Arab heritage. She uses that Middle Eastern heritage. She uses that Islamic heritage, that Christian heritage, the Jewish heritage. She uses that, the, the khat, the Arabic line in her buildings, they're all over the world. That's our heritage. But yet, how it's represented, that's always missed out. You know, when we do something bad, suddenly the term Arab and the term Muslim comes up. But when we do something good, it's an individual who's done something good. And that's the narrative we need to change. So I look at um, the Egyptian comedian Rami, and I absolutely love his, his work. The way, the, the, the subtlety, and, and he knows when to use subtlety and when to use shocking tactics. And he's brave, he's creative, he's intelligent, and he's very, very funny. And it's in people like him that, that, that we need. When people watch Rami, they don't watch him because he's Egyptian or he's Muslim. 
they watch him because he's a comedian. So, so with this idea of changing the narrative through through your work, how how has your work done that so far? How do you feel that it's been successful? I mean, it's not for me to tell whether it's successful or not. It's just for me to, as a storyteller, to keep telling the stories. We need to show what, you know, use all those methods. And I, I see around me this new wave of young people from the Middle East who are excelling in social need. And I don't mean as influencers, because, you know, we've talked about it, I don't like that term. As I would say, social media journalist. You know, it's a, it's a really important topic, this, this changing the narrative. And I, and I think all, all young Arabs have some role to play and have somewhere to fit into this. I, I wonder how receptive people's ears are to, to the message of changing the narrative. How would, you, how would you talk about making people more open to this idea of the Middle East being, being uh, you know, having a bright future? Well, I think, you know, the narrative has always been controlled by Europe and by Europe, I mean, very few countries in Western Europe. You know, the, the, the narrative isn't controlled by Italy or Greece. You know, the narrative is controlled by the UK, France, um, and the US primarily. You know, we've also got to look at that we're not just the same. Yes, there's 21 odd Arab countries or countries that consider themselves Arabic. But they're so different. But that difference isn't bad, not necessarily bad. Someone from Oman, which is one end, to the other side, Morocco, are not the same. They might, might both be Muslim by religion or primarily Muslims, but they don't have the same history and the same heritage. Before travel was so accessible, before travel was so easy, our artists used to travel and learn from each other. Why can't we do that now? And the other thing that I find, and I, I find it really, really off-putting, but we need to kind of, need to, to in a way, need to get over it and, 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 and be better than that, is this, um, the jealousy factor of young Arab artists, not young, but another generation of Arab artists where they don't support each other. You know, somebody else's success doesn't mean that we're failures. And our failure shouldn't make other people feel good. Yeah, I guess it's a mentality issue. I think so. Yeah. There, there's things I believe that would, that would uh, fuel that a bit more, this, this capitalist kind of mindset. It is a capitalist thing. It's, it's yeah. a very individualistic mindset. And as I said, we are not. Our heritage isn't. You know, we talk about, you know, when Achi, we use the word Achi, brother, Ochti, sister. But we don't act like that anymore. So, so focusing on, on, the, on the young British Arab viewer, for example, mm -hmm. um, how do you f hope your work inspires, inspires them? I hope it does. I mean, I hope, and I'm always, always happy and, and, and willing to give advice. They see the work, they read the stories, they're open to other experiences, and they are willing to learn. You know, through social media, it's been, you know, the perception is that things sometimes are easy. You know, how many followers you have and, and, and how many, you know, how many different products you can you can push on Instagram. But I think it's also in our power if we stopped using it, they have no more power. Don't let us brainwash, you know, don't let them brainwash us. What what do you love about your work? What do you love about what you do? I think my work has freed me. It's 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 allowed me to, it's it's almost like therapy for me. So I I know, I know you you come across a lot of people in, in your work. Um you know I was, I was looking up one particular example you you uh worked with a homeless filmmaker where you studied, you yeah. that was one of your subjects. Um, so I'm sure you've met so many interesting people and inspiring people, but would you say there's a moment in your work or an individual that you've worked with or about that has deeply inspired you? Well, from early on, I had a mentor and a very, very good friend in filmmaking and when I was in television who, whose work has lived and his advice, he's sadly passed away 12 years ago. In my last exhibition, one of our neighbours came and our neighbor is his name is timothy west he's one of a very well-known actor he's an old school shakespearean actor so there's no celebrity about him he's very well known. his wife is primella scales who played the wife in faulty towers and they came to have a look at the opening night of my gallery because out of respect and because they're my neighbors and they were invited so these moments matter to me and from writing these kind of prose and taking these pictures and producing all these wonderful uh products and outputs um would you say there's, there's a message that keeps reoccurring? Is there something that yes. you learn about life or, or the world? Not really. I, I, think, I think it's just, you know, I mean, for me, the, 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 as you said, the recurring theme is, is exile, loneliness. Yeah. And that's, that's clear. Unless I'm doing something on a, on, a, on a specific subject. So I'm talking, you know, doing larger projects like on, on the contribution of Arab artists. That needs planning. But yeah, on, on these writings, and there's no message behind them. It's just what I'm feeling. And I think... In this case, Instagram is good because it's an outlet. 
and luckily so far I've not received any abuse. So <laughs> most, most of the comments have been positive, but yeah, no abuse. That's good. Um, so the final kind of section or topic I wanted to touch on, which, you know, we've had throughout, because uh, it's, it's impossible to separate it from, from the things we're talking about, is, is culture and heritage um, and our identity, um, which are all really important things, both in our conversation and in all of your work. I, I guess my question is a difficult one to, to tackle, but what does it mean to be British Arab to you? And what does it mean to be to have identity, heritage, uh, yeah, in your daily life and in your work? It might sound controversial to some people. I'm British by passport. I'm Arab. There's no, I'm not a British Arab. I'm an Arab. I'm an Iraqi. Actually, I, I'm an Iraqi. But that doesn't mean anything. It just means that is me, that I'm Iraqi. I come from there. I was born there. My family are from there. My heritage, my history is that. But I'm not British by any means. I tried. I tried to become a British Arab or an Iraqi Brit or a Brit Iraqi. I'm not allowed unless I fit a certain narrative and I'm not willing to fit that narrative because I would betray myself. Bizarrely, I feel more Hungarian than British. And actually not bizarrely, I'm very proud and very loving. Forget the, the Prime Minister in, in Hungary and, 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 and the government there. But when I go back, I feel a certain sense of belonging of home because my, again, I have history then. I have a shared history with the Hungarians and they have a lot of the values that we have. In the Middle East. So yeah, I do feel I speak the language fluently and I like to I, I like to joke around with it because they look at me and they're like, well, how are you speak you know, it's not like English when everyone else is speaking it. It's a very, very, very specific country, uh, language. So yeah, I feel very Hungarian. So maybe I'm a Hungarian Iraqi. Well how do you feel your work as a as a British Arab in particular has contributed to British society? Well, my previous work has contributed a lot to British society because he was working on, on countering extremism through sports. So there's a lot of that work and, and a lot of a lot of a lot of the work was also here focusing on immigrant communities and integrating them into British society. While the, the, the mainstream narrative is that we you know we want immigrants to integrate, it actually it, it, it suits the system that they don't, because you'd always want someone to blame. And the easiest one to blame and when, when you need when when things go wrong, you don't blame yourself. So I realized that to, while well, to the wider audience it seemed that I'm doing a good thing, but to a certain specific group within the ruling elite, it doesn't fit. Because immigrants are supposed to be a certain thing when they are contributing to society. The net contribution of immigrants to the economy is it's a net positive contribution in every country. You know, I'm not attacking, attacking the empire. I'm attacking a narrative that says Britain is better than anybody else because I don't believe in any country being better than anybody else. I think I've done enough contribution to British society and you know I've, I've paid my dues basically. I've never I've never attacked it in this in essence I've never wanted harm. I just I just wish that there is an acceptance of certain faults over history the same way I would admit to mistakes I've made. Do you have a message or advice you'd want a British Arab listening to hear? Be open about who you are, because we are made to almost feel embarrassed and reject our own culture by the narrative around us. Don't listen to that. Read our literature, even if you don't speak Arabic, I don't, I, or you don't read Arabic. Read the translations, find out more, and hold on to those good things. Don't hold on to what you believe is being an Arab is. I mean, just be true to yourself. I mean, it's, you don't need to kind of be always conscious of it. Just if you know who you are, you're going to put yourself into your work. And I've, as I said, I've seen it. I've seen it with you now just over the last hour talking to you. And I've seen it and it fills me up with a lot of hope because we don't have to be 100% Arabic. We don't have to be 100% British. And I think you said that these days there's fluidity in everything. There's fluidity in gender. We accept it. There's got to be fluidity on who we are and where our heritage is. You know, our roots are there. And I think that thing is Arabness, you can't take it away. It's so strong that it's impossible to get rid of it. Even if we try, we can't get rid of it. So let's make the best of it. Thank you so much for your time, Yulem. I'm sure the listener will have enjoyed this and been as inspired as, as myself through listening to this. Um, thank you so much. It's been a thank real you. pleasure. Thank you, Tony. Iraqi, تعرض للنفي عاش يمام نبيل في المجر قبل مجيئه إلى المملكة المتحدة. عندما كان في السادس عشرة من العمر عانى يمام من صعوبات كونه عربيا في أوروبا
لكنه يقول إنه وعلى الرغم من هذه التحديات سيظل دائما مخلصا لأصوله العربية بدأت رحلته في العمل مع اللاجئين في مجال الرياضة حيث أسس FC Unity وهو برنامج لكرة القدم يهدف لتعزيز الوحدة والقبول والتفاهم بين الثقافات في الأوان الأخيرة أصبح فنانا ومصورا يوثق التراث الفني بشكل يتجاوز الاختلافات الثقافية والدينية والجغرافية سيضم مشروعه القادم الذي يحمل عنوان أنا مهاجر مقابلات وصور لعرب يعيشون في أوروبا ويأمل يمام أن يشجع مجال العمل هذا الأجيال الشابة على الافتخار بتراثهم العربي في الغرب هذا البودكاست إنتاج مشترك بين الفنار للإعلام وبوديوم دوت أم إي بتمويل من منحة المعهد الدولي للصحافة آي بي آي نشكر توني فرج ويمام نبيل لمشاركتهما في هذه الحلقة